Join me, five-time Paralympian Greg Westlake, as we journey across Canada to bring you incredible stories of how sport can heal, inspire, and bring communities together. This is Level Playing Field. Thanks for being with us. We have a hard-hitting show for you. Later, step into the ring with Jake Peacock, a boundary-breaking Muay Thai champion who fearlessly dominates his opponents. But before that, Join us as we venture to the majestic slopes of Whistler, British Columbia, with para-alpine sensation, Molly Jepson. I think all of what I do is fun. I think I'm very lucky to live the life that I live. I even love school, so for me, everything is kind of fun. For Molly Jepson, the mountains and slopes of Whistler Blackholm feel like home. Following a family tradition, her parents instilled a love for skiing in her from a young age. She put on her first pair of skis at just two years old. Molly's mother, Abby Malofsky, remembers her drive even at a young age. She loved being on skis and she loved going fast and wanted to go faster and faster and faster, always. And faster she went, eventually getting into competitive ski racing. Born missing fingers on her left hand, she initially competed in able-bodied events However, it was in 2010, during the Olympics and Paralympics held in Vancouver and her beloved hometown of Whistler, that her true goals became clear. The energy of it, the way that Whistler changed with it, um, was like, yeah, like I, for some reason I wanted to be a competitive athlete and I just like was like, yeah, this is what I want to do. Although her goals became clear, she soon realized that her journey wouldn't be a smooth one. When I tore my ACL, it was like in May, I think, and I, and finally just like started having results that season. The injuries were hard for sure. Uh, I mean, obviously harder on Molly than any of us, but she was only 13. Then at 15, Molly tore her ACL yet again, which left her with a difficult decision. After that, it was just never really like a question. It was like, I can't really see my life without having skiing in it. So I guess I was kind of going to go through it to come out on the other side. Molly's former head coach with Para Alpine Canada, Jean-Sebastien Labrie, remembers having doubts when Molly first joined the team. I just remember a young, really uh, young, talented skier. Well, the first camp she came and uh, joined with us, uh, she injured uh, her knee. Uh, so that was the start of her career with our team and definitely was something that uh, we were worried about. Molly silenced those worries when she burst onto the Paralympic scene with remarkable performances at the 2018 Winter Games in Pyeongchang. And the young Canadian is the Paralympic champion of the women's super combined. Molly's impressive medal haul included a gold and super combined, along with a silver and two bronzes. Oh, it was so exciting. It was, it was, it was so fun and just, I mean, bursting for sure. Yeah, it's super amazing. I am also still not one that likes the like attention on me like that. I, I love the sport and I'm competitive and I want to win, but I don't need everyone to look at me and like sing the anthem and stare at me. And I remember being like really awkward. There's a picture of me and I'm like, hi, like my hands aren't up. They're like by my head. They're like, ah, ha. Shortly after her achievements, Molly found herself confronted with a new challenge. This time in the form of a Crohn's disease diagnosis not a huge shock. I had had kind of issues for a long time. It was almost a little bit of a relief, but at the same time it was like, come on. <laughs> like, and then I didn't know how to manage myself after that for a while. I was just so stressed. I didn't really know how to turn it off after the games. It was like, I didn't know how to train. I was either zero or a hundred. There was no middle ground. I, I think that's pretty common for most athletes. They just don't really know how to do things after the games. You've just been working so hard for something for four years and then it like, all stops and so I just didn't stop. I kept training as if the games was in four days or a week away um, for months and so I think progressively that just started like really affecting me and my health and my stress levels. You know it's tough to watch her have to continually deal with different things that get thrown at her but you know she's Molly and she always seems to rise above it or find a way to work through it and, and uh, you know get to a comfortable position for herself. Finding that comfort level wasn't easy, but she started to find ways to manage her needs. By being at school and skiing, I totally like reset my system. I started getting healthier again. I would go train for a week and then I could come back to school and 
if shit hit the fan skiing, I could come back to school and everything was okay. I was still a human, I still had the same value. Like it wasn't like my whole worth was tied up in my performance as a ski racer. Finding that balance proved invaluable when the COVID-19 pandemic disrupted her training for the Beijing games. Despite social isolation challenges, she remained focused and determined. She secured another gold medal in the downhill event and a silver in the giant slalom. It's Jepson who is celebrating at the bottom of the hill by a tenth of a second. As a crowning achievement, Molly had the honor of representing Canada as the flag bearer during the closing ceremonies. It was, yeah, it was all super emotional. My coach cried, I cried, my friends cried. It just, I realized how not about me it was and just how happy I was to have those people with me at the time. I think it, even if it's an individual sport, it was amazing to see everybody rally uh, around all the challenges uh, Molly faced. And it was amazing to see her uh, able to express her talent. After the games, Molly received the news that she would require another knee surgery this time with a longer recovery period. Considering everything she had already endured, it seemed fitting that she stepped back from ski racing. I knew that I was battling pretty strongly with my mental health, and so I knew I needed to put some focus on that. And I think just seeing what life was like for a minute without my number one identity being a ski racer. Like I backpacked Europe for the summer and I was like, whoa, this is the first time I've ever traveled without my skis. And like just to experience life from a different lens and kind of just take a couple notches down. I mean, I'm still in the gym. I'm still skiing more than I probably ever have. But just like relearning my love for the sport, why I'm here, why I love it in the first place. Luckily for Molly, this decision was fully supported by Alpine Canada and her former coach. Molly needed time to, uh, to step back, to have a different perspective on the sport, on the Paralympics, on who she is really as, as a person into all these last eight years that were really uh, challenging. So I think she needed to step away and I think it's a good decision. Even when taking a break, Molly always has to be doing something, starting with being a full-time student. I wanna work with athletes and I wanna work with athletes in the gym. Um, so that's what I'm working towards. I'm hoping that um, a background in psychology and neuroscience will have a bigger impact on the way that I would like to train athletes looks like in the future. And, so all this was sparked from my own injuries for sure and having grown to love being in the gym and seeing the benefit of that on my own performance. So yeah, that's my plan. It's definitely, I'm not trying to be working full time for many years. I want to enjoy my 20s and play outside and ski, but that's the goal. One of the friends she's been having fun with is teammate and fellow Paralympic downhill champion, Mac Marcoux. When the games were over, you know, she was so burnt out and I think she was well due for a, a solid break, so being able to just kind of separate herself from ski racing a little bit and focus on school and then focus on just playing outside and, and you know, being 23 years old and having fun. Ah! How good is it? So good! That fun includes hiking, backpacking, and biking around beautiful Squamish. But more recently, Molly has taken up a new adventure that Mac has been helping her with. Um, in December, I bought a snowmobile, so I've been sledding and learning to sled. Great time! It's pretty entertaining to see a little, little girl hop out of her big, big ranger and unload her sled in the parking lot. I think it's always funny. <laughs> with her sled, she ventures into the backcountry, accessing larger and more challenging ski lines. So I've just yeah, started to learn like a whole new side of the ski industry which has been really, really fun and really rewarding because it was very much like start, starting at square one, like terrible. Like I felt like I was on like a little kid on the bunny hill again and it was like super rewarding and fun. I wasn't like frustrated or like angry because I didn't ski well. I was like, I suck and I know I'm gonna suck and I'm gonna learn from it and it's gonna be fun. I'm so happy. It's been fun to watch her having fun skiing. Oh, that feels so good. <laughs> so while she's been having fun, in the backcountry and trails of beautiful British Columbia. Rest assured, she's always thinking of next steps. This winter has allowed me to be like, yeah, like I cannot see my life without skiing. So it was just an important for me to like take a step back and be like, what am I doing here? Do I still wanna be in this space? I've just achieved my greatest goals, now what? 
you've reached the pinnacle, really. There's no greater honor than being the flag bearer. You got a couple of gold medals in your pocket, some silver and bronze to go along with it. So, you know, know that you've, you've done all of those things and be in it because you love ski racing. She's proved time and time again that she's, uh, she's one of the best skiers in the world in, in her discipline. And I think that, you know, in some ways it's like riding a bike, you know, might have to knock the rust off a little bit, but when, uh, when she's ready to get back into it, she'll be, she'll be climbing back on the podium in no time, I think. For now, she's just going to enjoy the outdoors. Being outside for me is just like kind of the end all, be all of when I'm not doing super good. So yeah, hiking, biking, sledding, skiing is all. Yeah, if my life could just over, like just be outside all the time, I think I'd be a very happy person. Woo! Molly's experience away from competition has allowed her to focus on her education and live her outdoor dreams. But there is no question that when the time comes, Molly will be ready to compete for Canada on the world stage. Coming up on Sport Explained, we break down one of the Paralympics' most dangerous sports, para-alpine skiing. Then, we head to Calgary and the Muay Thai gym owned by fighter Jake Peacock. First, a break. Stay with us. Level Playing Field will be right back. Now back to Level Playing Field. Sport Explained, para-alpine skiing, an adrenaline junkie's dream. Para-alpine skiing pushes the body to its maximum in one of the fastest human-powered sports. Para-alpine events are divided into five disciplines. Slalom, giant slalom, super G, downhill, and super combined. Skiers start perched on top of a snow-covered mountain and descend the course filled with jumps, bumps, and gates with the goal of being the fastest through the circuit. They do this with three main pieces of equipment, skis, boots, and poles. The type of skis used varies depending on the category. Standing skiers use traditional skis, long narrow boards that attach to the athlete's boots, allowing them to glide on the snow. Skis have a slightly curved shape with tips and tails pointing upwards. The base of the skis are smooth, usually made of plastic or metal, and have sharp metal edges for grip. Bindings on the skis secure the boots in place. Ski boots are crucial for support, control, and power transmission between the racer and the skis. The soles of the boots have grooves that fit securely into the ski bindings. Seated skiers use monoski, a specially designed seat with suspension mounted on a single ski. Ski poles are long, lightweight sticks with a grip at the top and a pointed tip at the bottom. They have a circular disc called a basket just above the tip to prevent sinking into the snow. Athletes may use one or two skis and compete with one, two or no poles, depending on their impairment or class. Some classes use shorter poles with a small ski at the bottom and a forearm grip handle at the top called outriggers. All sitting skiers also use similar outriggers. Para-alpine skiing features three main categories for classifications, standing, sitting, and visually impaired. Standing has nine sport classes, sitting has five classes, and visually impaired has three. Blind and partially sighted athletes employ a guide who races in front of them and provides verbal cues about the course through a headset to assist in the descent. Now you're ready to hit the slopes. Level Playing Field will be right back. Now back to Level Playing Field. In the world of Muay Thai, there is no para division, but that suits Jake Peacock just fine. The two-time WBC Canadian welterweight champion, who was born with an underdeveloped right arm, has always let people's presumptions about his abilities fuel his competitive fire. Mm. <clears throat> I was never, how am I going to block this or how am I going to do this? I just, I just react and respond. In the combat sport of Muay Thai or Thai boxing, fighters can use a combination of eight body parts for strikes to their opponent. The shins, knees, elbows and hands. But that's not always the case. Muay Thai is the art of eight limbs, that's what they call it. And I'm fighting here with seven. Jake kicks you and he makes you pay. Right on oh. the straight left. And Nick is in trouble. Oh! Oh! Jake all oh. over him. 
Whether fighting for his next championship belt or training at the gym he owns, Jake continues to excel and beat any barriers in his way. I genuinely haven't found that there's something that I cannot do. I just haven't found it yet. Jake Peacock was born with a congenital amputation of his right arm. Growing up, he was often bullied and stigmatized for his missing arm. Back in the day, I was just angry. I was just annoyed. I was annoyed when people look at me. I was obviously annoyed when people comment. And, and, and even up, up until my age now, people think I can't do things, right? My parents wanted to put me in it for an extracurricular activity and to learn some self-defense. Living in South London, a little bit of a rough area. Um, they wanted me to learn how to defend myself and be able to handle myself. Jake's parents enrolled him in karate when he was seven. However, he wanted something more physical and eventually discovered Muay Thai. It was like this the ultimate stand-up sport. So there was a when I found it, I was like, yeah, this is this is solid. Like you got boxing, you got your legs, you got elbows, it's the whole package really. He now competes in the featherweight 145 pound division. Jake's wife, Krista, thinks this competitive weight class brings the best out of him. Oh, I love watching him fight. I love the sport of Muay Thai. I don't get like nervous that he's gonna get seriously injured. I think because I know the sport really well, but I just love to watch him fight. He dog shakes it off. Jake getting a little tired. No, never mind. If you can't hear us, the crowd is just screaming for their hero, Jake Peacock. My division, 145 pound division, is notorious for being the best, baddest division on the planet. So it's wherever you go in the world, 145 pounds, you got the best. Jake is 11 and one as a professional with all but one of his wins coming by way of knockout. I have the uh, WBC Canadian title, the American Lion Fight title, and I'm the former European Lion Fight title holder as well. Wow, 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 wow. It's over! On top of being a champion in the ring, Jake is also the owner and head coach at Dunamis Gym in Calgary, Alberta, where he and a couple coaches train amateur and professional fighters in Muay Thai, boxing, and kickboxing. As soon as this punch lands, I'm throwing my hook. Jake also trains there himself, perfecting his technique with his pad man, Chris McMillan. Slip uppercut, elbow. Again. Having one arm, he's very good at adapting left and right, whereas most people are traditionally going to be standing in one stance. I know the power. Obviously, I feel it on the pads, and um, I know if he's going to touch you, it's, you're going to have a really tough time. So he's very hard to prepare for. Everybody sees one arm, and they think, OK, I'm going to attack that side. But you know, he's, he's lived it with his whole life. I think I've been blessed with being uh, having a strong mental side to myself, but it has developed over time. The, the strongest thing for me, the, the, the biggest impact that's, uh, that I, I've experienced is my faith in God has allowed me to be confident. And now whether I win or lose, I'm completely content and confident. So now I can go out and compete wholeheartedly with everything I got. People underestimated Jake and he he has reached levels that no one thought he could, and he sees that in other people, and I think that's what makes him such a great coach and such a great leader in the gym, is he sees potential in each member. Members like John Nguyen, who appreciates the way Jake trains. He's very inspiring, you know, with his hard work, attention to detail. He's uh, real, like, honest. Like, if he, if he sees you gotta work on something, you have to, he tells you what it is. He doesn't, like, I guess, sugarcoat anything which I, as a fighter, need. 10! Too slow, bring it back. I keep it real, keep it real, yeah. My, my, <laughs> my, my slogan here is be about it. Be about it. Uh, don't talk about it, just be about it. You know, if you say you're gonna do something, do it, you know, and, and get it done. The other slogan we have here is sink or swim. And uh, it sounds, sounds scary to people on the outside that, you know, might wanna join the gym, but we're super friendly. You know, everybody succeeds in here. That's the thing. That's it, that's it, that's it, that's it, that's it. Given that, I wanted a lesson from Jake. So I put on my boxing gloves and faced a kicking bag with my carbon fiber legs ready to fight. You've got a bit of foundations already. I can see a, a little bit of sense of yes. uh, some striking. I saw you hitting the bag. We'll work, uh, let's work a couple kicks now. Sure, sure, yeah. love to. Small step, boom, kick. So a couple jabs, take your time, get your feet underneath you, step and kick. 
Yeah, you won't want to get hit with a carbon fiber leg. <laughs> that is for sure. Wicked. Every time you're going to get back to your, your stance, your foundation. What's something that's like a fundamental that even like the pros forget that. about, like just right back to your stance? From here, you can defend, okay? You can counter, you can be offensive, defensive, like you can do everything from here. As soon as someone breaks that base, I mean, most of my finishes in my career actually, right. most of the finishes come because they lost their foundation. Their foundation, their stance was gone. Jake's character has never faltered and the community he built reflects how much his dedication to teaching means to his students. You know, lead by example. He is the guy that is leading by example, and I think he sets the, the bar really, really high. So they're very lucky to be training under a guy like that. I think one thing that Pete draws people to Jake is he is so authentic to himself. He won't be somebody for somebody else. So he's created at the gym an environment where Everyone can just be authentic. Everyone can be real. We're not walking on eggshells. Like Jake is so true to who he is that I think people are drawn to that. And he has such a passion for people. You you want to do a sport, you can, you can make it happen. Whether you're missing one limb, two limbs, whatever it is, if there's always a way. Think outside the box, surround yourself with good people and positive people, people that will help you reach those goals and you gotta have a strong work ethic because you're gonna, you're gonna have setbacks. You're gonna have setbacks, keep pushing through them. I'll, I'll keep fighting until, you know, it, it doesn't make sense to fight anymore and yeah, we'll see where it goes. Combat sports like Muay Thai are definitely not for everybody. But there is no doubt Jake has the mentality and talent to keep knocking down opponents and preconceived notions. In the time I spent with Jake, I could tell he is a great coach, a family man, and someone with a bright future. And that's our time for this edition of Level Playing Field. Thanks for being with us, and see you soon. Host producer, Greg Westlake. Senior producer, director, Ted Cooper. Director of photography, senior editor, Matthew McGurk. Integrated described video consultant, M. Williams. Supervising producer, Michelle Dudas. Produced by Evergreen Productions. Copyright 2023. An AMI original production.